We just want to honor you in this year, Father God. We just want to advance your kingdom and do your will. We thank you for you are Jehovah Nisi. You are our banner. You are our covering. Father God, we thank you for being our defender, for being our protector, Father God, for being our sword and our shield, Father. And we know that as long as we are in your will, as long as we have you, Father God, there is nothing that could come against us that would ever prosper, Father God. Not in the year of 2021, not ever, Father. For we know that you are the king. You are sovereign. You sit on the throne, Father God. Even amidst all the chaos and, and turmoil in this world, even amidst all of the, the strife between you know, leaders in the world, Father God, you are the king. You are sovereign. You reign and you rule, Father God. We know that you have the final say. We know that you are in control. God, we thank you for this day. We thank you for the opportunity that we have to come directly to you. Uh, through your son and through his blood, we have direct access to you as our father. And for that, we're really grateful. God, we pray right now that uh, we keep that fire and we keep the fervor to continue to seek your face, oh God, and to seek the kingdom and to continue to have hunger and to have thirst for righteousness and for the kingdom. God, there are so many dreams and there are so many aspirations that young people have and that our generation has, but we can't complete those things and we can't do those things without you and without your guidance, God. So we seek you now not only for uh, your help and our guidance for what we want to do in our lives, but so that your will is done in our lives, oh God. We have to know you and we have to be close to you to know what it is that you would have us to do, God. So we pray um, that we continue that fire and that we have that zeal to seek your face, oh God. I pray um, that nobody does not feel that they can't come to you. I come against any spirits of fear or anything that gets in the way of us knowing that we have that direct connection to you and that we can seek you, God. We're not chasing you because you're not running from us, but we are seeking you and we are pursuing you, God. All those things that stand in the way of us seeking you, God, remove them. Your word tells us that nothing stands in the way of your love. Now, no height, nor depth, nor principalities. There's nothing that stands in the way of your love. So allow us to remember that nothing stands in the way of our access to you. That no matter what we do, no matter how far we go, no matter how far off we feel like we are, that you're not mad at us and that we can come to you and that we can seek you and that we can find you, God. We thank you for being our father. We thank you for being our protector. We thank you for providing for us. Over the year, there's been a challenge in your God, but you have kept us. And for that, we are grateful for that. Listen, we give us that we do your will, that we be in your will, Father. We ask you to touch our hearts and open our eyes that we can see. Open our hearts that we can receive, Father. Because I would decide to do your will, Father. Father. We come to you today and we ask you to lead and guide us and, and use us for your service, Father. Oh, Lord, that's our hope. That's our desire. Father, is to follow you, Father, is to be who you call us to be, that we walk in the path that you laid out for us. And Father, we just want to love you today. We just want to say thank you. Thank you, Lord, for who you are. Thank you for what you've done for us. Thank you how you blessed us. Thank you for the doors that you opened for us. Father, as we ask you to look on this day and we we pray your blessings upon our life. We pray your less blessings upon our church, on our leaders, Father. We pray that you will look on them and that you will bless them, Father, and that you will give them an ear to hear. Father, they can hear you and that they can be the person that you ordained them to be, Father. And Lord, I just want to thank you and I praise you today, Father. In your name we pray. Amen. Rejoice in the Lord. We come to give him a hallelujah praise on today. Hallelujah. Come on, let's be thankful unto him and bless his holy and matchless name. 
Hello, my name is Marie DeBose. I'm here to bring you the prayer focus. Our word today is joy. And I'm reading from Hebrews chapter 1, verse 9 of the NIV. You have loved righteousness and hated wickedness. Therefore, God, your God, has set you above your companions by anointing you with the oil of joy, joy. Sometimes we say leap for joy. And we know when we feel joy, we feel happiness and we want to express it. And we thank God for his joy because that is the best kind of joy. Let us pray. Lord God, we wanna thank you for joy, for the joy of the Lord is our strength and Lord your word said with joy we would draw water from the wells of salvation and Lord salvation rescues us salvation delivers us salvation redeems us from destruction and for that we say thank you and Lord we thank you for your joy that's overflowing us even now for in your presence is fullness of joy and at your right hand are pleasures evermore. And for that we say thank you. Lord, we thank you for your love. We thank you for your peace. And we thank you for your joy. It is in the name of Jesus that we pray and thank you for it. Amen. Get your Bibles, go to Matthew the 10th chapter, Matthew the 10th chapter, and I'm going to be reading from the NIV, but I want to talk to you today, and I'll give you the title of the message. It's just simply contradictions. I want to talk about contradictions. I want to investigate just for the next few minutes some of the contradictions. Thank you so much, Sister Willis. Um, the, the contradictions that we're experiencing right now. You hear the word contradiction, and you think that something that is being presented is not as truthful as it should be, or somebody might be trying to fake us out. And that's what I think of. When I think of contradictions, I think of how, you know, you say one thing, but you see another. Or you're expecting one thing, but it turns out to be something else. And contradictions aren't all negative. In fact, we live a life as believers of contradictions. I know that almost seems oxymoronic, doesn't it? But I want you to hear this. Before we go to Matthew, let me share Proverbs 8 and 33. This is just for those who like to have an appetizer before the meal. Proverbs 8.33 says, listen to my instruction and be wise. Do not disregard it. That's NIV. King James says, hear instruction and be wise and refuse it not. So listen to my instruction and be wise. Do not disregard it. Not Terrence's instructions. Not Pastor Lachey's instructions. But the word of the Lord by virtue of its written value and its revealed value. Now there's a difference between the written word and the revealed word. One's not bad and the other one's good. No. We can read the written word. In fact, with these eight um, students, we're going to be reading the written word. But my expectation is that we will also have a revelation of the word so that we can apply it to our lives. And every time we get one of those, come on, look at somebody and say, I need some of that. I need some revelation. Every time, we're going to pause, stop, and give God thanks, all right? So let's pray over the revelation. Father, we thank you for the word that we're about to receive in the book of Matthew. I pray that you would reveal it to us in a way that we've never heard it before. It's written. We'll read it. But you reveal it. Make our lives better, even in the midst of these contradictions that we live. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 
All right, so you got Matthew, the 10th chapter. Let's go there. We're going to be reading this entire chapter, so you got to go with me. We're going to go fast. We're going to go with it. And I'm going to do some expository teaching on it. But I also want to lay a foundation for you to have something to study this week. I know you say, well, what about, you know, that we're going to be in that book, right? Yeah, we got that. But I want you to think about what we're seeing here. It says this, Jesus called his 12 disciples to him and gave them authority to drive out impure spirits and to heal every disease and sickness. Uh, you've already identified contradictions, right? How many disciples in this room? We're disciples, right? All of us, we're all disciples, right? This is not an indictment. This is an observation of contradictions. An observation of contradiction. So he called his 12 disciples. He called his 12 disciples to him, and he gave them authority to drive out impure spirits, unclean spirits, one translation says. One translation says devils. So he gives them the authority to drive out unclean spirits and to heal every disease and sickness. Every. Every. All of them. Ones we know, ones we don't know. Ones that they got prescriptions for, ones that they don't. The ones that have a cure, those that don't have a cure, because he gave them authority to do it. All right, next verse, real quick. It says, these are the names of the 12 apostles. There's um, Simon, who is called Peter, and his brother Andrew, James, the son of Zebedee, and his brother John, Philip, and Bartholomew, Thomas, and Matthew, the tax collector, James, son of Eliphaz, and Thaddeus. Simon the Zealot and Judas Iscariot, who betrayed him. How many just saw another contradiction? Are you looking for contradictions now since I told you? What's the contradiction here? He's listed his 12 disciples by name, and one of them is a contradiction. Because disciples don't betray Jesus. Or do they? Or have we? Or is you? I mean, <laughs> You get it, right? Okay, so let's go to the next verse real quick. Contradictions. These 12, Jesus sent out with the following instructions. Do not, do not go among the Gentiles or enter any town of the Samaritans. Go, rather, to the lost sheep of Israel. As you go, proclaim this message. The kingdom of heaven is near. Heal the sick. Raise the dead. Cleanse those who have leprosy. Drive out demons. Freely you have received, freely give. I'll pause for the contradiction. <laughs> freely you have received. You're not paying for this. It won't cost you anything right now. So you should go and give it like you got it. Just like you got salvation, I want you to go and give salvation. Just like you got revelation, go and give revelation. Just like you got healed, go and heal. Just like you got delivered, go deliver. Just like you close to God, go get somebody else close to God. Heal the sick, raise the dead. There's a contradiction. Because there's some dead folks in here that just ain't been buried. But here's the contradiction. The Bible says if you die, you'll live again, right? So it's okay to be dead. I didn't say be sleep. I said just be dead. How many of you look at it from that angle? You're like, I'm dead. I'm dead to the old way of life. I'm dead to sin. I'm not moved by the stuff that the world. So here's a contradiction. So you got to weigh contradictions. You can't just say, oh, that's bad. That's a contradiction. You see, the, the, the possibility of us understanding this has to be cloaked in contradictions because God knew that we were going to live most of our lives in contradictions. So the message is even coded in contradiction. It goes on to say this. Next verse. Don't give any gold, don't get any gold or silver or copper to take with you in your belt, meaning you don't need any money. No bags for your journey or extra shirt or sandals or staff for the worker um, worth, is worth his keep. All right? Whatever town or village you enter in, search there for some worthy person and stay at their house until you leave. And as you enter the home, give it your greeting. And if the home is deserving, let your peace, or bless it, let your peace rest upon it. If it is not, let your peace return to you. Quick, quick sidebar. I, I typically, whenever I go to people's houses, 
I always leave a blessing there. Yesterday, I went to the DeVos' house, house, and I was greeted with a blessing. The blessing was already there. It was no point in me even trying to leave a blessing. But I said, and, and that doesn't mean you're not supposed to do that, but, but I, was, I was convinced at that moment, there's no point in trying to pronounce a blessing over this house. It's already here. But there will be places that you go that you'll have to pronounce a blessing because that's what we're supposed to do. That's who we are. You never even thought about that, huh? You go over your sister in them house, what you cook? When the instruction is come into the house and, and, and speak a blessing over the house. Contradictions. I'm just bringing out the contradictions because when you leave here, you're going to be like, oh my God, everything that I'm doing is in some way a contradiction to something else. But if the peace is already there, cool, you're good, you're good. The home, if the home is deserving, I don't have time to unravel that. It, it has nothing to do with your opinion of that home. Deserving meaning that if the presence of the Lord could potentially rest there, leave it there. That's really what that means. It doesn't mean if it's clean enough for you, if they got modern furniture, if it's up to date. Okay, it says this. If, it says, if it is not, let your peace return unto you. Meaning you bring peace with you, and you take peace with you when you go. You don't leave it in chaos. You don't tear nothing up, and you don't make any judgments. You just come in peace. And you leave in peace. Peace is your vehicle when you show up, and you leave in the vehicle that you came in. All right? Contradictions. I know you're thinking about every time they come to my house, they leave confusion. Because they're not necessarily following what it's saying here, but you know, we disciples, right? Give us some latitude. The next verse. If anyone will not welcome you or listen to your word, leave that home or town and shake the dust from your feet. Don't even take a chicken leg off the table. Just keep going. It's all good. Peace. Deuces. Bye. See you. Call me. <laughs> Whatever you need to do. Truly, I tell you, this is when it gets serious because, you know, when you see words like Sodom and Gomorrah, you're like, oh, my God, the judgment of the Lord, right? Here's some contradictions here. Truly, I tell you, it will be more bearable for Sodom and Gomorrah on the day of judgment than for that town. Oh, wow. I have to widen the scope here because, you know, with the judgment of Sodom and Gomorrah was that God rained down fire and brimstone to destroy those two cities because of the magnitude of sins, plural, not one, multiple sins. All we do is just go to one thing and be like, oh, my God, I can't believe it. There are cities on this continent that are worse than Sodom and Gomorrah. So he says, it'll be more bearable for those cities in the day of judgment for the town that will not receive the blessing, the greeting, or the truth of God. Let's look at the next verse. I'm sending you out like sheep among wolves. Sheep among wolves. That's a contradiction. Because the first verse said, I'm giving you power to heal the sick, raise the dead, to overthrow stuff, to put order and structure. But now you got to be sheep among wolves. That's a contradiction. Isn't it a contradiction that you would send somebody out to go and turn the world upside down and they're like, ah, sheep. As opposed to wolves. I was going to make a wolf sound, but anyway. Think for a moment about how contradictory it is, and now I'm beginning to scratch my head in the spirit going, what is he saying to us because I can identify where we've come short on the things that we're supposed to do, but how in the world can I identify with something as weak as a sheep when we are among wolves, and he's sending us out into that to become lunch? No, that's not the case. It says, therefore, be as shrewd as snakes. So you're telling me to be like a snake? It's a contradiction, because the last snake I saw in the Bible was Satan himself, the serpent that talked to Adam and Eve in the garden and said to her sin, right, slithering around. (laughs) But the word of God says, therefore, be as shrewd as snakes and as innocent as doves, all together on three contradictions, one, two, three, contradictions. So shrewd as a snake. Innocent as a dove. Huh. He didn't say split personality. He didn't say bipolar disorder, of which there are people who battle those diagnoses. That's not what he's saying here. 
What he is saying here is that you have to look at the contradiction and find yourself in it. Next verse. Be on your guard. You will be handed over to the local councils to be beat in the synagogues. Flogged. Some of us in this room have never been in a synagogue, so don't apply to you. No, that's not exactly true. There will be persecutions that are expected and anticipated for us as believers, which is a contradiction because, remember, we're the head, not the tail, above and not beneath. We're blessed when we rise. We're blessed when we lie down. We're blessed in the city. We're blessed in the field. Late in the midnight hour, God's going to turn it around. Fred Hammond, 1996. That's a contradiction that, as disciples, we're going to be handed over, flogged, and it's in the synagogues. Next verse. On my account, you will be brought before governors and kings as witnesses to them and to the Gentiles. These are Jewish people he's talking to, and the contradiction is that Jewish people didn't have any dealings with Gentiles, but he's telling them, oh, they're going to deal with you. You're going to be all in that, and you're going to have to come on my behalf. Now, this is in the recruitment speech of his disciples. This is when he called them together, and they were like, ooh, we get to follow Jesus, we get to follow Jesus, we get to He's like, shh, wait a minute, let me tell you what's going to happen. I know you think, because I got on this nice fine robe, that you about to get some fishes and some loaves. But the contradiction is that there's going to be a lot of things that happen to you that you didn't anticipate all in the name of who you are for me. The next verse says this. Or you're getting through all of it. But when they arrest you, don't worry about what to say or, or how to say it. At that time, you will be given what to say. I won't even talk about arrests in the 21st century. Let's just stay in the Bible. But don't worry about it because you're going to be prepared if you are yielded to what it is that I'm trying to say. But when they arrest you, do not worry about it or what to say, how to say it. You'll be given what to say. Next verse. For it will not be you speaking, but the Spirit of your Father speaking through you. Now, that's a contradiction. Because I know if 5 drove up on me right now, I probably had something to say, right? Especially if I'm not guilty. Especially if I'm just a black man in America trying to breathe. Right? I want you to think, let's take it out of the 21st century. What was Jesus saying to his disciples when he says, don't even worry about it because you're going to be arrested. You're going to be suppressed. You're going to be in some way unjustly treated by people in authority. Don't worry about what to say. Don't get a speech ready because I'm going to give you what to say in that moment. That's a contradiction because everything within me starts to line up as to what I'm going to say when they come at me. Next verse. Brother will betray brother to death, and father his child. Children will rebel against their parents. <laughs> Somebody like, now you're on my street, and have them put to death. Now, the reason why this is a contradiction is because didn't we get saved to avoid all of this? Didn't we become Christians so that this would not be in our houses and within our families and within our units of, of familiar but it looks more familiar than not, and so let's own the contradiction to the fact that just because we're saved don't mean that we are not going to experience these things. That's the contradiction. Keep going. You will be hated by everyone because of me. I, I like the fact that he qualified because of Christ. Now, if they just hate you because of you, you on your own. They just hate me because, because what? <laughs> because they, because because of you, and then we can do about that. That's not a contradiction. So look here, you will be hated by everyone because of me, but the one who stands firm to the end will be. What does that say? Amen. Say it out loud, because a few folks are falling asleep. Amen. There we go. Next verse. We're almost done. When you are persecuted in one place, flee to another. Truly, I tell you, you will not finish going through the town of Israel before the Son of Man comes, which simply is a proverbial statement that you won't get to the whole earth before Jesus Christ comes back as it relates to moving from place to place. Keep moving is really what he's saying. Keep on moving. 
keep on moving. It didn't say go to, from church to church. They don't like me over there, so I'm going to go to another church. They won't let me use my gifts over there, so you go to another church. There was a preacher who told some, some people who came here, don't go there because they're not going to use you. Oh, we go, you, we, uh, that's a contradiction, right? <laughs> Next verse. <laughs> the student is not above the teacher, nor the servant above his master. Notice the contrast of those statements. Student, teacher, servant, master. He's given the contrast so that we can understand how order is supposed to work. And the contradiction of that is what we're going to see. We see oftentimes people want to tell the preacher what to do or tell the teacher what he or she should say and what they need to do is. And then there are people who are indebted as servants, indebted. Now, that's not talking about slaves and racists. We're talking about people indebted. The person indebted is not above the person that they owe it to. You can't tell Citibank what to do if you owe Citibank. (laughs) Sally May you will have to call her Ms. Sally Mae and put some respect on her name. Seriously, the mortgage company that you're indebted to has every right to ask you when you're going to pay. What a contradiction. Because if they call me, I'm going to tell them, tell them what? That I'm saved, sanctified, Holy Ghost, filled, fire, baptized, and what? Next verse. Here we go. We're wrapping this up. It is enough for students to be like their teachers and servants like their masters. If the head of the house has been called Beelzebub, how much more the members of his household? (sighs) I got to I got to unpack that one right there. Right. If the person in charge is the devil. If the people leading the process is full of the devil, then how much more would the people who are following be the offspring? That's why we pray for our leaders. Point in this direction and say, no bells above there. Because, <laughs> I mean, you're not, you're not children of the devil, right? Nor am I representing the devil. But what happens is that people act like they're full of the devil, and then you got somebody like a parent or leader trying to live saved or show them godly ways. What a contradiction. He's clarifying the fact that somebody ain't telling the truth. So when we look at this, let's look at it. Let's look at it. Next verse. So don't be afraid of them, for there is nothing concealed that will not be disclosed or hidden that will not be made known. So in other words, he's just saying, no matter what you see, if it looks like it's contrary, I know they ain't doing that over there great. I know they ain't carrying out like that. It's going to all be revealed. It's going to be revealed. That's one of the reasons why it's a transit ministry to, for some, because they don't want to handle the truth. I've had people step far back away because, you remember those Sundays that I preached about, you know, fornication being wrong and sin being things like putting you know, substances in your body like smoking and drinking, and those things are sinful because we're damaging the temple. Yeah, folks get mad about that. Folks get upset, and they feel like I'm preaching on them. What a contradiction, because I'm preaching on me. (laughs) Because I don't want that to be named among me so that I don't end up in a place where I am a contradiction. You follow me? So don't be offended by the law of the Lord or don't be offended by the word of God. Don't be offended when somebody hits something that you're struggling with. What you do is you come clean and say, Lord, wash me, purge me, cleanse me so that I'm not a contradiction. We got enough of them. We got enough of them already. There are enough contradictions that until Jesus comes back, you can pick your poison and think you're going to make it in. That's a contradiction. The next verse. That's right, Elijah. Uh (laughs) Uh-oh. What I tell you in the dark, speak in the daylight. What is whispered in your ear, proclaim it from the roofs. So God is, is simply encouraging you that the revelation that you get through what Matthew is saying, that Jesus said to his disciples, tell somebody. If you want to talk about something, talk about the fact that we're doing everything that we know to clean up our lives, to live for Christ. And it's not just through works. It's by our faith in God, and it's through the grace that God pours out 
whenever we invoke his presence. The next verse says this. This is what I'm trying to get to. Don't be afraid of those who will kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Rather, be afraid of the one who can destroy both the soul and body in hell. That doesn't require a whole lot of explanation, but the contradiction is that we want to live forever. The contradiction is that we think that we're not supposed to get old. The contradiction is think that we're not going to ever die, that we're going to be forever. The contradiction is that saints go home and be with the Lord and sinners go home and be with their Lord. I know, it's kind of mind-blowing, isn't it? The next verse. Are not two sparrows sold for a penny, yet not one of them will fall to the ground outside of your father's care? Meaning that they're both worth the same amount, but God is going to take care of them. God takes care of you. God is looking out for the person sitting in front of you, behind you, next to you, down the road, just like he's looking out for you. The contradiction is that we think we're the only one. We think we're the only one going through, or we think we're the only one blessed. We think we're the only one that can do that, or at least we're the only one that can do it better, right? God is saying, just like sparrows, both of them are in his hands. That's where the song, His Eyes on the Sparrow, came from, just so y'all would know the inspiration. The next verse. And even the very hairs of your head are all numbered. I will make no reference to the hairs that you purchased. I will not discuss the ones that you lost or the ones that you turned a different color. I will not discuss those hairs because it's not qualified here. Whatever hairs of your head, they got numbers on. Am I right? I know it's true. I was, I was at, the, at the beauty supply store. The woman said, I want a, a, a number 47, a pack of 47 curly. Yeah, there we go. Well, before you get too lost in that, understand this. He's saying, he's saying, I know exactly everything about you genetically. I know your DNA. I made your DNA. And so while we can have fun with these scriptures, the, the, the contradiction is that sometimes we'll try to switch ourselves up thinking that God don't know us. When God know you, he knows us. That's not embarrassing. If anything, it's assuring to know that we have a father who knows the number of hairs on our head. I just wish he had told us ahead of time. It's like, <laughs> you only going to get so many. Last, last verse. I believe it's the last, or close to the last verse. All right, the next one. So don't be afraid. You are worth more than many sparrows. So that's part of the, the uh, exhortation regarding the two sparrows. He says you're worth more than many of them. So you're not a two-cent person. You're worth many, 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 many more sins than that. On the next verse. Whoever acknowledges me before others, I will also acknowledge before my Father in heaven. Keep reading. But whoever disowns me before others, I will disown before my Father in heaven. Do not suppose that I have come to bring peace. Here's another contradiction to the earth. I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. Isn't he called the Prince of Peace? No, by the way, this is just foundation today, just so you know. So, so he says, I didn't come to bring peace. I came to bring a sword. But my name is Prince of Peace. And he shall be called. Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, the Prince of. So, so I'm scratching my head again in the spirit. Why are these contradictions being brought clearly? This is Jesus himself speaking through Matthew. Jesus himself is speaking to say, you think that it's going to be what you want it to be when I came to tear some stuff up to build the kingdom of God the way that it's supposed to be. That's why religion hurts. That's why it's painful when somebody tells you truths that don't fit within our paradigm of what we think religion should be that we learned from somebody who was religious that learned from somebody else who was, who was religious. And so that's why it becomes kind of weird because now the sword is cutting. The word of God is like a two-edged sword and it pierces and divides asunder the soul from the spirit like bone and marrow. And the word of God tells us that it's quick, it's alive, it's sharp, and it's powerful, even more powerful than a two-edged sword. So Jesus is wielding a sword in order to bring some disruption in a good way. A disruption. I, I just want to live. You just want what? what? You just want what you want. Well, what does God have for you? And what did Jesus come to tear up, to build up? 
All right, last few verses. For I have come to turn the man against his father, a daughter against his mother, a, a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. There's no contradictions there, so let's keep reading. Um, <laughs> <laughs> We've seen that, right? We've seen that. Let me show you this. A man's enemies will be members of his own household. That's a contradiction. Not in a good way, but it's a contradiction because, I mean, hey, if Jesus could have his disciples and one of them, surely we're going to see this. I hope this is bringing some clarity to you. Next verse. Anyone who loves the father or their mother more than me is not worthy of me. Anyone who loves their son or their daughter more than me is not worthy of me. These are such contradictions because how in the world could Jesus be teaching love your family and love God and love people and change the world? But he's saying, if you love these things more than me, then you're not worthy of me. Next verse. Whoever does not take up their cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Now we can say amen to that, right? Amen. Until you got splinters in your back. And when he says, take up my cross, he says, you're going to take on the same shame. The same shame of an open crucifixion. Here's another contradiction. Whoever finds their life, and this is the one that I'm landing on, I'll pick up next, next time that we are together. Whoever finds their life will lose it. Find, lose. He didn't say whoever loses their life will find it. He says, whoever finds their life will lose it. You say, well, is it lost? No. When you think that you found your life, God is going to require that you give something up. And whosoever loses their life for my sake will find it. That is the quintessential essence of contradiction. What has all of this said to us? What are you saying, Pastor, about these opposites, these things that seem to be so different than what I thought? Because isn't it God loves everybody and he wants everybody to get along and he wants the peace to, to rest upon us and aren't we blessed and we don't have to go through anything and we're going to sprout wings like angels and fly to heaven one glad morning when this life is over? Now, what I'm pointing out to you is that here's some realities and some truths of which we've got more questions than answers. Who would agree that you've experienced some things recently that you got more questions than answers? If I had the answers to them or if I had the divine revelation to solve all of your issues and your problems, I probably wouldn't be standing right here. But I know somebody who does. You know what I believe? I believe that the contradictions exist for the purposes of bringing us into a place of God. I don't know, but you do. I'll spend some more time breaking those down. I gave them to you in a lighthearted way just so that you can leave here thinking about, wow, all this time I was under the impression that. If you Google contradictions in the Bible, there are some people who will literally try to line Scripture up and contradict one thing to the next thing, and that's not the contradiction that I'm talking about. I'm talking about the rhetorical sense of one thing looking like it should be this when actually it's this. It's not deception. But contradiction is used in order for God to give us balance. In order for you to gain God, you got to lose you. And when you lose you, you'll find yourself in him. That's the greatest revelation of all of those contradictions that are being spoken there. Where we've made a mistake or where we've missed it mostly, we, 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 the body of Christ, is looking for the validation of finding ourselves in a place that God's not. You say, well, you know, I come to the church and the church is supposed to make you feel good. No, that's not, the, that's not what the church is for. Well, shoot, I never thought I would be hurting the church. He said, your whole house, somebody in your own house is going to portray you. So why would you think the church would be any different? Now we supposed to follow Christ. They did. Until he got arrested. 
And then they all split and went their ways, right? Especially that one named Peter. I was reading something else about Peter, uh, specifically in that study that we're going to be doing starting next week. Interesting thing is that Paul had an opportunity to meet Peter, although he did not hang out with the disciples and he was not one of the 12, Paul was not. He had a chance to meet Peter. He got a chance to meet James, too, the, the brother, half-brother of Jesus. And do you know that when he met them, he had a few choice words? Seriously, they had contention. It wasn't like, oh, Peter, I'm so glad to meet you. I've been, I've been hearing about you, and I've just been waiting all my life to meet you. Since I've been converted, you heard about my conversion, right? That wasn't that kind of conversation. Do you know that Paul had to address Peter on the contradiction that Peter was living because he watched Peter say that he would have nothing to do with Gentiles because he was a Jew, but then he was hanging out and eating with them. And we find in the book of Acts where Peter had his own encounter with God about rise, slay, and eat, but Paul had a problem with it. You didn't know that it was kind of drama even among folks in the Bible days, right? Well, the reason it's there is because God wants to show us that there will be times that we're going to need clarity. Now, Peter is Peter, all the way from the first time we hear about him, all the way to the very end of the book. But Paul was bold enough to say, wait a minute. So how are you going to have the audacity to try to hold somebody accountable for what you're supposed to do in the church when you're doing something completely different? I'm just giving you the, the real example. How can anybody in here hold somebody else in contempt when we're all guilty of something? I'm not giving an okay for nobody to go sin or you leave me alone. That's not what I'm saying. I'm not even saying you do you, boo. No, that's not what I'm saying. I'm saying that the contradictions exist for us to observe them and to begin to execute some measures to get out of the contradictions and line up with that word. Somebody in the church ought to say Amen. The contradictions are revealed so that we'll know where we need to come up to. Nobody else's standards. Nobody else's expectations. But conviction under a contradiction will bring me to a place of repentance. If I say I'm saved and I'm not acting as if I'm saved, it's a contradiction. But if I'm acting saved and I'm not really saved, contradiction which is worse neither both and uh huh <laughs> so we have to find that space where we're lining up with God's revelation of who we're supposed to be can you stand with me real quick I want to pray and we're going to go because the contradiction of church being in a building was dispro disproved I took the poll. Folks have gotten saved, folks got healed, folks got jobs, folks got delivered. A whole lot of stuff happened. We weren't even here at the building. That's a contradiction. How many can say right now you're facing contradictions of massive proportion? That every time I want to do what's right for God, evil shows up. And Paul said it like this, that which I would do, I did not. And that which I despised, I find myself doing. That's another example of contradiction. I want you to leave here today thinking about every contradiction and stop on it and figure out, wait a minute, which way should I really go if I want to be who God called me to be? I don't just accept the contradiction and keep moving. But once it's been revealed to me, I've got some choices to make. Brother, Brother Kevin, I'm not going to spill all your business, but you came to me and you said, I don't want to be a contradiction. And we stood right out there on that grass, and you and Kathy got married. Because you said, I don't want to be a contradiction. And she said, I know that's right. You see, you can, you can correct the contradiction. You can, if the car is steering out of control, you can, you can say, Jesus, take the wheel. And you can line up. We can line up. I can become a better man. You can become a better woman. 
I can't become a better woman. I don't want to be a woman. But there are people who live those contradictions. You get it? But when we find ourselves in Christ, contradictions pushes us toward the right thing to do. They don't condemn us. You know, I can't leave the day without quoting something from Romans 8 chapter. There is now therefore no condemnation to those who are in Christ. For the law of life in Christ makes us free from the law of sin and death. What a contradiction. Let's lift our hands, and if there's anyone who wants prayer, make your way quickly. I'm praying for contradictions to be broken. I'm praying for you to meet the realities and the truths that you need in order to get out of those contradictions that are going in cycles and circles around in your life. Move quickly, make your way to the front, and just spread out. We don't, we ain't going to touch and grab and hold and move, but I just want you to make your way because the altar of the Lord is open. So feel free to come and hold your head up before God and say, Lord, I'm here because the contradictions have been revealed and I can see where I got to make some changes. I can see where I got to do something different. I can see where things need to be new in my life because the way that I'm going right now is in the opposite direction of where you want me to be. What I'm experiencing right now does not line up with what you promised regarding my identity in the earth. Come on, if that's you, make your way to the altar really quickly. Don't deliberate with it. Don't play with it. Be real. And if the contradiction ever reveals itself, now would be the time for you to deal with it. Now would be the time for you to say, you know what, I've had a contradiction going for a long time. Yeah, it's not, it's not lining up. It's not lining up. I said this, but this is happening. I want this, but I'm experiencing this. And you promised that, but I'm only getting this. Come on, is there anybody else? Real quick, real quick, real quick, real quick, real quick. Remember, we're not doing what we did before. Remember, we're not doing what we did before. If you're going to come to the altar, come. And move quick with an expectation that God is going to do something different. This is your first time you knew. Well, the protocol is the altar is open for us to pray specifically that God would break whatever is on you all. And that you would leave this altar a free man or a free woman from any of the bondage that the enemy has tried to associate with your identity. If any man or woman be in Christ, they're a new creature. Old things are passed away and all things have become new. The devil's a liar. He can't even uphold the truth. And the contradiction is that he's tried to get you to believe something that's not true. He's tried to get you to think that you'll never make it and that you're not worth it and that you are a loser and that you're not going to rise. The devil is a liar. We call him out. And we reveal the contradiction is that you're really a king. You're really a queen. You're really God's choice. You're a royal priesthood. The truth is that you are a holy nation and you are a godly people. You've been called out of darkness into the marvelous light of God. That's the truth of the matter. But the contradiction seems to override the truth. And so we adjust. We start adjusting. You don't get dressed in the pig sty. You get out of the pig sty. And when you return home, then you get the robe and the ring of gold. So if you're outside of God, leave the pigsty and come home. Leave the place of contradiction and come to where you belong. you got a place where you can be seated along with Christ in heavenly places according to the Word of God. And if where you're seated right now is not a heavenly place, then it's a contradiction. The Bible tells us that blessed is the one who walks not after the counsel of the ungodly, nor stand in the way of sinners, nor sit in the seat of the scornful. And if the seat you're in is scornful, that's a contradiction. So I break it now. I break the contradiction off of these who come to this altar. And in the name of Jesus, by the authority of God and the power of the Holy Spirit, I speak liberty, I speak life, I speak freedom, and I speak deliverance into every area of their lives now in the name of Jesus.